My guest today is Mori Baja. He is a, an associate professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at the University of Texas and former NASA engineer. Moriba, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, if we might start out, you've got uh, some interesting stuff on your, your resume. We're talking about going to Mars, and you know a little bit about that, having been a navigator on several of the NASA Mars missions. So just uh, for a couple of minutes, tell us uh, your history on that, how you got into it, and what, what that entails. Yeah, so basically, um, at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, one of their missions is the uh, robotic exploration of, of the solar system. And uh, I was able to get a job, uh, you know, in the navigation and mission design section there back in like 1999 as I was going into grad school. And the the job itself is is really focused on how to how to use uh, measurements collected about where objects are in the sky uh, to figure out you know where these things have been and help predict where they're going to go. And so a spacecraft navigator's job is really to say, listen, we have this ideal path where we uh, want the objects, uh, the satellites to go. And we know that life is imperfect. We have imperfect measurements and uh, there's some elements of randomness scattered in there. And so, you know, given where, where the, the, the path that we want to be on, where are we? And then how do we get back onto that ideal path? And so the navigation team is really all about taking these measurements from these huge radio dishes, uh, you know, on how far the satellite is and how fast it's moving away sort of thing. And from that, doing the uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, activity of really trying to understand how this spacecraft is behaving and, and using that understanding to maximize the ability to accurately, you know, predict where the, the satellite's gonna go. Now, we're in a bit, I'd like to get to talk ab about going to Mars with uh, human beings, but clearly there's a, a good bit more that NASA is going to, and others are going to be doing before that happens. Uh, and I'm curious uh, if you've been uh, following and see what's on the horizon in terms of unmanned uh, flights in the next few years. I know there's been an announcement of a mission to bring back a, a, a sample from Mars uh, scheduled for the 2030s by, uh, of course, uh, Elon Musk has talked about it being there <laughs> already with people by then. But uh, what more can we learn from unmanned messages besides pure science in terms of preparing to send, send people to Mars? Is there, is there more to it that we have to learn, uh, you know, other than the engineering challenges? So I think the engineering challenges definitely are, are probably, pr probably first and foremost, but, you know, look, we, we humans have evolved on this third, you know, rock from the sun that has a lot of water, uh, has a nice dense atmosphere, um, has a global magnetic field, has a really large moon that orbits every 28 days that regulates our lives, certainly uh, cycles, uh, you know, for women and that sort of stuff. Mars lacks all this stuff. So, so you know, my question is, just because we want to be on Mars doesn't mean that we can. And I think that robotic missions have a lot to provide in terms of helping us fill out the gap of, is, that, is this something that's even possible biologically? I mean, even if you shield yourself from radiation, have air to breathe, find a way to do that, uh, find a way to thrive with food in, in such a, a scarce uh, environment. Look, just the whole moon thing by itself and the lack of a global magnetic field, that's going to have an impact on, on, on our biological systems in one way or another. And I don't know that that's known well at this time, like what that impact might be. So I suspect some things we're going to have to learn along the way. And it's certainly not going to be in the absence of the loss of human life. Like, exploration historically has costed lives and to think that we could find ways to settle human beings on Mars in the absence of that I think is uh, naive at best. So 
uh, clearly then though you know the biological challenges are are substantial but it's it's more than just uh radiation we don't know how we're going to deal for example with you know there's nine months of microgravity getting there but then there's low gravity uh living there you know elon musk is talking about colonizing um mars but we really have no idea what what indefinite amounts of time and 40 percent gravity is gonna is gonna do who's is there any anything being done to try and study that or is it just impossible i think that uh to some extent experiments done on the space station uh, might be crafted to give us some insight to, on that. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, without actually being there and exposing people to that level of, I'm going to call them resistant forces, normal forces. Uh, yeah. It, part of it is you have to learn it as, as you're there and as you experience some of these things, but we'd certainly like to minimize We'd like to minimize the amount of on-the-job training uh, as possible. Well, and of course, there's you know you know there are attempts to um, to simulate uh, the environment of being Mars. Unfortunately, they really can't simulate the, the radiation exposure and the um, uh, and uh, the uh, you know low gravity. But for example, the isolation and, and the like. But I, I just recently saw that there was there there's a there have been uh, experiments to do that on top of a volcano in Hawaii, and one of the recent uh, groups only lasted four days. That doesn't uh, portend pretty well. Are you uh, are you aware of any such experiments that have been a little more successful? Because I know just the, the human isolation is going to be a problem. Well, so, you know, part of these experiments, I, I it's a little, uh, you know, tongue-in-cheek sort of thing uh, with me because I look at you know, the, the traditional ecological knowledge, uh, knowledge that comes from certain indigenous people. And, you know, pe people are trying to set up these isolated uh, kind of experiments. It's like, look, look, just go talk to the Inuit in the Arctic. You know, it's not like, you know, it's not like life has been easy for them. They've been very isolated. They've been uh, uh, thriving in environments with huge scarcity of resources and that sort of stuff. I don't know, go talk to, you know, the Aborigines or go talk to other indigenous people that have uh, been very isolated and had to thrive in, in very scarce uh, resource environments. I don't see, I don't see where uh, organizations that are scientific and technical are reaching out enough to indigenous people and respecting the fact that even though they don't have three letters behind their names, there's a lot that they've learned over millennia. You know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel on this. That is a, an interesting viewpoint on that. Um, now, how about, you know, just in terms of getting getting people to Mars, um, I've always felt that, and of course, we've seen that Elon Musk is over-optimistic on, on many of the things that he has gone after. It's not surprising and um, that, that he might be over-optimistic on that, but he has made some amazing progress uh, 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 with some of the SpaceX uh, technology, but in the final analysis, uh, the, the biggest factor may be cost. I mean, is it realistic for, for him or for NASA to get to, to Mars by the 2030s with human beings? So I, I see everything that Elon does through the lens of this uh, kind of mantra that he has of, you know, humanity needs to be a multi-planet species. So even his Starlink satellites, you know, what he's invested there uh, in terms of like global internet, you know, how he looks to AI and automation for a lot of uh, the technologies that, you know, uh, he tries to develop. To me, it's almost like uh, I see Elon's activities somewhat akin to Legos. It's like, uh, you know, you can, you can build some pretty interesting things with Legos or very simple things, but at the end of the day, these are fundamental building blocks that snap in a certain way and it's up to the uh uh you know the artiste to to figure out how these things are are connected so to me all of his technologies are part of this lego set this you know this the astronautical lego set and what whatever people think he's doing to do stuff here on earth uh they should be rest assured that it's all really underlying this idea of 
uh, having hum humanity uh, experience life on other celestial spheres. So. Well, you mentioned something of Elon's. I'll digress a little bit from Mars because I know it's something else you're concerned of, and that's his Starlink system. Because I know that you're very much concerned about the proliferation of space junk and uh, have been uh, sort of leading a bit of a campaign to do something about that. So, so you know, you use a phrase, uh, tragedy of the commons, that's popular with futurists and economists as well. So uh, tell us a little bit about your, your concerns in that area. Yeah, so we have this growing population of uh, so-called resident space objects. Right now, the largest public catalog or database of these things is maintained by uh, U.S. Space Command. Not now, it was U.S. Stratcom, now uh, recently U.S. Space Command. And let's say that they track around 26,000 objects, size of a softball, all the way to the space station. Um, and, you know, given this 26,000, currently maybe 3,000 work, everything else is garbage. Um, we don't launch things in random orbits. We're very purposeful uh, with where we put objects, try to take advantage of, of nature as much as possible. So that means that we have highways in space, very specific ones. And as opposed to highways on Earth where uh, you have cleaning crews that, that, that are able to remove rubbish from the road and stuff when there's accidents, when accidents happen on these highways uh, in space, they, they keep on going. And, and, and they stay in, in, in these highways, but they can cross lanes uh, with, with some level of randomness. And between, you know, SpaceX, OneWeb, um, and, and, you know, Amazon now with, with the Kuiper project, uh, certainly, you know, SpaceX wants to launch the most of these objects. But we're talking about almost doubling, doubling the catalog of currently tracked objects in the next five to ten years. So. The other thing, too, is that we don't fully understand the effects and impacts of the space environment on how objects behave. Uh, we don't track things uh, so precisely that we can predict where they're going to be like two weeks from now. So we have a problem with really with predictability. So I tell my students, if you want to know something, you have to measure it. And if you want to understand something, you have to predict it. And we don't share all the measurements. That mean, so that means that our knowledge can't be as good as, as it could be. And certainly, because we have an inability to predict very accurately over long periods of time, that also says something about our lack of understanding. And, you know, Elon likes to automate stuff. He's already automated his Starlinks. He's launching 60 of these things every few weeks. Here's one thing that I want to add. In all of my scientific experience so far, I've seen that Mother Nature likes to seek states of equilibrium. Do we know what the state of equilibrium is for these orbital highways? Uh, I would say that putting 60 things into, pumping those into the population every few weeks doesn't even give us enough time to know what state of normalcy and equilibrium actually is. So our space operations is out in front of the headlights, uh, as it were, uh, with regards to regulatory framework works that can help uh, maximize long-term sustainability of the environment for future generations. So these are my concerns. And is there any solution to cleaning up that junk? Because obviously it's a hazard to anything that's in orbit up there. Or are we just kind of stuck with it? Well, so we're mostly stuck with what's currently there. Uh, I think thinking about cleaning up the current population, uh, you know, comprehensively, I think that that's ludicrous. Like there's no way we get there. So we have to, to some extent, we have to know how to live with the current population. Um, we can behave in ways that don't promulgate creating a whole lot more of the debris. So we can do that. So debris mitigation, uh, if everybody kind of adhered to some general tenets of uh, how to mitigate debris, I think that would be very helpful. But then the removal part, the remediation, as they call it in the community, there are definitely people looking at that. I know the European Space Agency wants to retrieve this Vespa, uh, 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 you know, large, you know, piece of debris in like 2025 with, with clear space. So those are good things, but, you know, 
if you wanted to make a sizable dent in the current population, you'd have to retrieve many of these things every year. And, and we're talking about retrieving one of these things in 2025 because it is expensive to do. So I think debris mit mitigation, you know, do everything possible to not create more of it. And, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, we, we humans have learned how to live quite well in our own filth so far. Uh, and I think um, that's going to be true for a, a very long time. All right. Well, let's uh, just to get back to Mars. So obviously there are, it's a compli complicated situation with the, the uh, economic cost, the human biological and psychological challenges, the physical engineering challenges. In your mind, do you have an, a realistic idea as to when we're going to get there or is it just impossible to foresee? Well, for one thing, uh, I'd like to say this. If you look at exploration historically, great risks were taken in exploration, uh, back to the loss of human lives and all these things. I feel that in general, the public, and, and let's say uh, for sure the US taxpayers, have developed an allergy to any sort of activity that falls short of guaranteeing success. And so if you say, yeah, we're gonna explore Mars and we'd better be 100 or 99% successful, that is one of the main drivers of cost. So one of the main drivers of cost is having to guarantee all this success. Uh, and it also means that when we do explore, we're not really taking big leaps in the risk we're basically doing the same thing that we did before and just incrementally making changes. At that pace, we've basically pushed out the ability to actually get people on the planet uh, for the foreseeable future. I think if we wanted to get people to Mars uh, and we were willing to assume almost any level of risk in doing so, we could probably send people to Mars next year if we wanted to do that. We, it, to me, it's not, it's less about the, the actual cause, the, the, the economy, and more about the tolerance that we have, as humans have to accepting risk. And it's like, is it okay for this, this, this new set of astronauts that got selected, let's say they're the first people to go in like a couple of years or, or whatever. Uh, how comfortable would, would, would we be uh, knowing that it's highly likely that it would be like a one-way trip? Would, would we as people embrace that? And I'd say in today's society, the answer is no. We just, we won't do that, so. Well, that's, uh, that of course was always my, my uh, uh, concern. Uh, you, you know, I remember when um, Mars One, which I think is dead now, came out and it looked for volunteers to go on a one-way trip to Mars. I was stunned at how many people actually volu were volunteering to go to Mars. Like, what are you gonna do when you get there? <laughs> you know, right. watch, uh, watch Netflix on a 20 minute delay. There's, it's, it's just gonna be stark raw survival and and there's nothing to do there but survive um so you know we'll see let's look you know even further out because there have been some some pretty wild plans out there in terms of like terraforming mars i mean is that something that's even even remotely uh, realistic or possible uh even within this century uh looking all the way out to the end of it i'm going to i'm going to be bold and say that the actual terraforming is possible uh, to, 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 to really get underway um, you know, over the next century. The thing is, back to we as humans and looking at ethics and, and, and moral values and these sorts of things, would we as a humanity embrace that? And I would say by and large, the answer is no. Like there are a group of people that would say, yeah, it's, it's we as, as a humanity need to do this for survival. I, I will even put it in even more stark terms. Uh, you know, even though the, the pace of, of, you know, birth rates and that sort of stuff, maybe overall, maybe slightly decreasing, but look, we have uh, a finite uh, amount of land on the earth. Even within that finite amount of land, there's even a more finite amount of land that can produce food for, for all of us. Uh, Humanity is increasing 
uh, you know, the number of humans is increasing as a function of time, whether the rate is slowing down or whatever, you know, the population is, is in growth. I don't see that changing unless there was some major cataclysmic event, but barring these kind of one-off things, uh, the trend is that's not going to stop. So if humanity wants to be a long-term species, there's no choice but to find ways to uh, inhabit other places. And Mars just doesn't have all the things that we need. Ethically, are we okay, again, with changing the structure, the climate uh, of Mars to make it more amenable to, to humans and, and life as we know it? Um, I personally don't have ethical issues with that, but I know that many people do and will, uh, religious and, and, and otherwise. Um, so I think those are probably the harder barriers to actually get through versus technological ones. Yeah, and you're not the only one to, to talk about that e either. You can go to Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy, where he foresees a Mars where uh, there is a, a political battle but, uh, among Mars colonists about keeping Mars, quote, red and terraforming it. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of not like there are any advanced Martians there that we know of that we're going to be hurting, but who knows? Who knows? At any rate, uh, I'd like to thank you for this. And I did also want to note that you are, um, a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And there's a big conference coming up in November, the Ascend Conference. And I just wanted to remind everyone that this uh, series in part is uh, a lead up to the Ascend Conference, which will bring kind of everyone involved in space, both the, uh, the governmental uh, uh, agencies and space commerce uh, all together in, in um, Las Vegas in November. And uh, so I'm hoping maybe we'll get to see you there. Yeah, so, so, so if there's one thing that I could kind of, uh, you know, add to this is, um, you know, if people could imagine what a TED conference focused on astronautics, space and stuff would be kind of on steroids, that's what uh, Ascend uh, is shaping up to be. So I'm looking forward to, to being a part of it and, and, and certainly able to kind of showcase a lot of the work that we're doing here at UT Austin regarding all these uh, topics. That sounds very interesting. I hope to be there myself. Um, um, Maria, but thank you so much for joining me. Best of luck and uh, look forward to maybe uh, seeing you at Ascend in November. All right. Likewise, my brother. Thank you very much.